Dr. Nardi here back with another video and in this video I want to talk about research methods as it relates to abnormal psychology. Now before I go into current methods I want to take a step back and talk about what we used to do to treat quote-unquote abnormal individuals. Now many many years ago during the ages of enlightenment uh, often if somebody was deemed mentally ill, they would often claim it was demons, or they'd call this demonology. And they would talk about how there were supernatural forces that would cause abnormal behavior. And this was very prominent, I should say, uh, until about the Age of Enlightenment. So right before the Age of Enlightenment, it was very um, common. Prehistoric times, they actually used to drill holes in people's heads to release the evil spirits. That doesn't uh, really work very well either. With the ancient uh, Greeks, they used to talk about the imbalance of humors. They say that's what accounted for abnormal behavior. So if you were lethargic or sluggish, uh, it was believed you'd have an excess of phlegm. If there was an overabundance of black bile, this was believed to cause depression. If there was an excess of blood uh, created, uh, this would create uh, a sanguine disposition. You'd be very cheerful, confident, and optimistic. And if there was an excess of yellow bile, this made people very quick-tempered and, and they would get angry very easily, again, according to uh, the ancient uh, Greeks. And maybe you guys have seen some movies about exorcisms, uh, and this really came out of the Roman Catholic Church, and this was during uh, the, the medieval uh, period. Um, so the, the Roman Catholic Church really believed in evil spirits uh, or the devil, uh, and they would perform exorcisms to remove uh, these evil spirits. The other thing throughout history, and I know I'm jumping around timelines here, is witchcraft. This was the late 15th to 17th century, and again, uh, there was a lot of, how should I say, persecutions of individuals, particularly women, and they were accused of witchcraft. Now, church officials believed witches made pacts with the devil. And sadly, the way they would diagnose you of being a witch is to dunk you in water and to see if you float. And if you floated in the water, then you were a witch. But if you drowned, then you were innocent and you weren't a witch. It did not work out for anybody. And it was a very sad and dark time in history. Now, by the late uh, 15th uh, and early 16th centuries, a silence or they used to be known as madhouses, began to crop up throughout Europe. And again, uh, they would put a, a lot of individuals uh, in these asylums. Um, and one of the most famous one is St. Mary's of Bethlehem Hospital. Uh, again, it, it basically was a place where they'd keep individuals uh, who had bizarre antics they referred to them as. Now, what do we do as far as modern research methods, because we don't drill holes in people's heads anymore, we don't worry about bile, what do we do? Well, that's a great question, and I'm gonna answer that right now. What we do is we do the scientific method. That's really what we do to kind of get at and understand abnormal behavior and individuals who are suffering um, from uh, various uh, mental disorders. And there are four objectives of science, and you might have heard about this in other videos, but I'm going to reiterate them here very quickly. Uh, one tenet or one objective is to describe. So we try to describe what is going on with an individual. Uh, we also try to explain behavior, right? So we try to describe it. We try to explain it. We try to predict behavior. Can we predict an individual's behavior? It's very hard to do, even though we're getting better at it. And the last tenet of science, or the last goal, I should say, objective of science, is to try to control people's behavior. And those are the four objectives of science. Now, the scientific method, if you think back and remember maybe to your earlier days in school, or if you took a, a research methods course, 
you would remember that first you formulate a research question and you frame your research question in the form of a hypothesis, you test your hypothesis, and then you draw conclusions about your hypothesis. And there was more detail, and I have other videos where I go into more detail about these hypotheses and the criteria that are required. So if you want to take a look on my channel, I definitely have more videos there for you to peruse. Um, now, the other key point that I will make in this video is ethics. Now, ethics and research is so important, especially when we're dealing with individuals who are um, suffering from a mental disorder. Uh, now, the IRB comes into play, the Institutional Review Board, and this really protects human subjects. And there's a whole reason why this came about, and it's really about the unethical treatment of individuals throughout history. So now we have the IRB board, and two things I want to point your attention to, and again, I have videos about the IRB process as well, but two things I want to point your attention to is informed consent. Now, this is a principle uh, that... Uh, is in place so that individuals who part of your study receive enough information about your study to make a decision beforehand and they can decide to freely participate or not. And the second thing I want to point you to is confidentiality. Now this is the protection of the identity of participants by keeping records secure and not disclosing their identities. I think these are the two tenets. There's more about it. And if you look on my channel, I have other videos, but I'm going to just talk about those two for this video. Now, how do we, as far as a research methods approach, how do we uh, get about assessing um, or, or uh, you know, um, recording individuals' behaviors? What, what paradigms do we have? Well, we have naturalist ob naturalistic observation, and again, with naturalistic observation, it's a form of research in which you as the researcher, um, you observe and measure an individual in their natural environment. So you'll go to where the behavior is. Now with this, you want to be unobtrusive and you want to minimize interference. And sometimes what happens is if there's the presence of an observer that might distort individuals' behaviors. And um, that can actually change how somebody acts. So you want to be on as possible. And this really gives you information about how a subject behaves. But I will tell you this, it does not tell you why somebody behaves a certain way. It just tells you how they behave. And the good thing about this is it so it happens in the natural setting where it occurs. So again, you, it's very high in what we call external validity. And again, I have a whole video about this as well. So take a look on my channel. The other method we could use is correlational. Now, the correlational method is just uh, looking at the relationship between two factors or variables. Uh, it could be more than two factors, but you're just looking for a relationship. And a couple terms pop out, and again, I have videos about this, is the correlation coefficient. And this is a statistical technique we use. And all it does is it allows you to describe a relationship along a continuum uh, from negative one to one, and the closer your correlation is to one, the stronger the correlation, and the negative and positive sign indicate the direction of the correlation. Again, if you're interested in this, I have a whole video on it on my channel. We also have longitudinal studies that can be conducted in conjunction with correlational research. And basically, uh, with correlational study, you just um, test people over a long period of time, but these usually take a lot of money and obviously time to conduct, but these are popular uh, in the field of developmental and also abnormal psychology to kind of track and follow behavior and see if people have, you know, changed. For example, if you some kind of intervention you do or just kind of monitoring how a disease progresses. We also now can talk about the experimental method. And the experimental method is a scientific method to discover the cause and effect relationships. Now, to get a cause and effect, um, ideally you want an experiment. Uh, this is pretty much the gold standard to get a cause and effect. There are ways you can get a cause and effect through statistical techniques, but for this class, cause and effect is really found out through experimentation. And there's a couple terms that you should keep in mind. The independent variable. Now this is the, uh, the factor or the variable that you're manipulating as a researcher. The dependent variable is the variable that you are measuring. And then often 
you'll have an experimental group, and this is the group that receives some kind of treatment. And then you have your control group, and often this group uh, does not get the treatment, but they get a placebo. Sometimes just giving somebody a pill or doing something to them can alter their behavior. So we usually have a control or placebo group. And then we have a hallmark of experiments, our random assignment. And all that means is each participant has an equal chance of being assigned to either group. Now we can have different types of independent and dependent variables. And if you look on the screen here, you'll see some. So a type of independent variable might be the type of treatment with different uh, types of the drug treatment or physiological treatments. So there's different levels of the independent variable. Uh, you could also have experimental manipulation so the type of be beverage consumed, you could have alcoholic versus non-alcoholic. Um, you could also have different treatment factors. So brief treatment versus long treatment or inpatient versus outpatient. You have a lot of options. Now with the dependent variable, you have a lot of options too. Uh, this could be a behavioral variable. You could measure adjustment, activity levels, eating behavior, smoking behavior. Uh, you could have a physiological variable that measures physiological responses such as heart rate or blood pressure or brainwave activity. And I have other videos on my channel where I go into each type of, of uh, research uh, technique you could potentially use. And then you also have self-report. And these are usually where you ask somebody about their anxiety, their mood, uh, or their life satisfaction. This is where you actually take a survey. Now, a couple of the terms I wanna mention in relation to experimental studies. And you might have heard these terms before. And by the way, a placebo is just an inert medication or bogus treatment that is intended to control for expectancy effects. Because sometimes, just as I said earlier, just giving somebody something can change their behavior. You also might hear of a, uh, a single blind placebo control group uh, design. And all that means is that participants are uninformed about whether they receive the active drug or the placebo. Now, a double blind is usually the way we want to go because not only are the participants unaware if they received a drug or the placebo, but the researcher is unaware as well. So usually double blind studies are, are the way we like to go uh, in research. That way um, the researcher doesn't inadvertently influence the, um, the participant by acting differently towards them. Uh, a couple of the terms I want you to know is internal and external validity. Now, internal validity is really high with experiments. So if you're manipulating a variable and controlling for other variables, they're often high in internal validity. Now, external validity is how your results generalize. And I want you to know that there's a, there's a trade-off. There's a trade-off between internal and external validity. The higher your internal validity, the lower your external validity and vice versa. And again, I have whole videos on this as well. Um, Couple other things I want to mention is uh, sometimes in abnormal psych we have uh, epidemiolo epidemiological research. Try saying that ten times fast. And this is research studies that track the rates of occurrence of a disorder among a population. So we try to get at how many people are affected with schizophrenia, how many people are affected with uh, depression, or uh, bipolar disorder, or you know, uh, name a disease that we'll talk about. Uh, in my subsequent videos. Uh, I've mentioned this earlier, but we also have a survey method approach where you hand out surveys to individuals, questionnaires, right? And this can get at the incidence or the number of cases of disorders. This can also get the prevalence, right? The number of cases of disorders in a population within a specific period of time. Um, and there's different ways you can achieve this. Uh, you could do a random sampling of individuals where you everybody has an equal chance of being recruited. Um, there are more advanced methods of sampling. Again, I'm not going to talk about in this video, but you have various options to do so. Um, the other thing I will mention is often in abnormal psychology, we look at kinship studies. So we will look at a, uh, basically to understand the role of genes in the environment or what we call epigenetics. Uh, and we try to understand what is going on. You should be aware of genotype. That's a set of traits specified by an individual's genetic code. Uh, you also have a phenotype, and this is an individual's express trait. And there's also something called proband, and that's the case first diagnosed with a given disorder. Uh, another thing that you see a lot of are twin studies. Uh, and really why they do that is that you get at 
the gene environment interaction or epigenetics. And really, uh, they have fraternal twins and paternal twins. And um, it, it, that basically depends on how close genetically the, the uh, twins are uh, or monozygotic or dizygotic twins. That's also the same term. And again, we can, we can compare, right, genes versus the environment because sometimes what happens is kids are, are given up for adoption. So they have the adoption studies and one kid goes to live in New York, the other one lives in LA. And then we can actually compare those genes because the environment's different. So we could try to tease apart the gene environment interaction. It's not easy to do, but we could try. Uh, and the last thing that I will mention uh, for this video are case studies. Uh, and often case studies are seen, like you might think back to maybe an earlier psychology course you have, and you think back to Phine Phineas Gage, or um, I, there's other prominent case studies out there. And all a case study is, is a carefully drawn biography based on clinical interviews, observations, and or psychological testing. Um, and often you will see what we call single case experiment designs. And that's a type of a case study in which the subject is used as his or her own control. Um, again, you'll see that. And the other thing you'll see in research is a reversal design. And that's an experimental design that consists of repeated measurement of a subject's behavior through a sequence of alternating baseline and treatment phases. Again, that's a little beyond this video, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did so, please like, subscribe, and share. I have a bunch of videos on my page. And I will see you all next time. Take care. Bye for now.